Yeah, where do you want to put the chairs? I think closer to this is what it looks like now. I don't yeah. know. Um, is it possible to close the door? Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna be like spare. And um, Trevor, the uh, live stream picks up the microphones from the microphones, not ambient, right? You would have to turn off the ambient if you didn't want those at all. Okay. So I can show you how to do that. That'd be great. So this applies to a lot of the rooms with the ceiling mics. Mm -hmm. You hold down on the shield. I'll give a little count to 10 seconds. And then we'll see under here a ceiling is muted, the B ceiling.
check, 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 check.
think I are speaking. Yeah. This is interesting. Mike. Yeah, right. Got it. I'm very attached to Joe, did you meet Zach Wong? Oh, delighted to see you. I've nice to read see about you. you. Glad to see you. With nice to see you. Thank you so much. One of the great security experts Wonderful. around the world. Wonderful. Great, great guy. <laughs> Hello, Jay, where you are? Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, but uh, Joey starts, right? Where's Joey? Oh, yeah. All right, he's starting. Okay, okay, right here. Yeah. They took my towel off. Welcome, everyone. Just checking this is on. Excellent. Uh, my name is Joey Wozniak. I'm a current uh, MPA student at HKS in the second year of my program uh, and one of the co-chairs of the Innovating Democracy Caucus. I've devoted the last several years of my life um, to increasing youth voting rates uh, and leading various pro-democracy and pro-voter causes all across the United States. Well, I'm so happy to introduce everyone up here today. Uh, today's event was spearheaded by the Center for Public Leadership alongside support from our caucus. Um, so for our three special guests, um, the first is our moderator, um, Representative Jane Herman, a current Hauser leader with the Center for Public Leadership. Her public career included serving nine terms in Congress. Good hands. Good hands. <laughs> really including four years after 9-11 as a ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, she recently completed a whole decade of service at the nonpartisan Wilson Center as its first female president and CEO. Uh, she is recognized as a national expert at the nexus of security and public policy issues. Um, our second guest is Ambassador Tim Romer. I'm a former six-term U.S. Congress member uh, from Indiana and uh, the U.S. Ambassador to India. Uh, during his time in Congress, um, he served on the House Intelligence Committee and worked on education-related issues, uh, balancing the budget, as well as national security. Um, he's currently exec the Executive Director and Strategic Counselor at APCO Worldwide. Uh, and the co-chair of the Reformers Caucus at Issue 1. And for our final guest, uh, we have Congressman uh, Zach Womp, who served eight terms in Congress, um, representing Tennessee's third district, um, right north of um, two hours north of where I grew up. Um, in Congress, he served as the ranking member of the Military uh, Construction and Veterans Affairs Subcommittee, um, as well as other leadership positions on the U.S. House Appropriations Committee, um, he is presently engaged as a consultant in the energy and security sector. Um, he is also the co-chair of the Reformers Caucus of Issue 1. As part of CPL's mission to inspire and, and enhance the capacity for principled, effective public leadership, um, they invited the three to speak to encourage cross-party debate and model an example of civil discourse. Ambassador uh, Romer and Representative Wampa here today in their capacity as co-chairs of the National Council on Election Integrity um, that's a project of issue one and representative Harmon, um, who's also a member of that council will be moderating uh, today's panel. Uh, today's conversation will focus on urgent issues uh, and efforts to protect and preserve democracy in the United States, particularly those efforts aimed at reforming the Electoral Count Act. We're so grateful that um, they're all here. So with that, I'll take it away. Thank you, John. Oh, thank you. Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone. There's some very good friends of mine in this audience and ours. And I really want to thank uh, the Center for Public Leadership for somehow mm -hmm. figuring out that I should be a Hauser leader. I love it. Uh, with four others and uh, for an opportunity to do this event. And of course, when I su suggested uh, that we ought to do it with a couple of former members who happen to be buddies of mine, uh, the answer was yes, do it. And mm. so these are my buddies, uh, Tim and Zach. And I didn't realize that I served longer than you did. Not that I'm competitive. Combined. Nine. <laughs> no, not. Yeah, well, that makes me 200 years old. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> no, anyway, no. but smart. Uh, six terms, eight terms, nine terms, um, but but who cares? Uh, but Joey, you did not mention what, what happened to you. Where you are you? What you do? Could you just before you before we start this because it really is relevant to what we're going to talk about. Uh, I spent several years. Well, we want to thank you for what you're doing. And I, you know, I would predict, not that I have any scientific knowledge yet, that the turnout of younger people in this election nationwide is higher than it's ever been. And not that it's ever been very high, so it's kind of a low bar, but it's your future. And, you know, my generation messed it up. So you got to show up and vote and fix it. And while we're on it, I'm not going to out anyone, but I assume all the Americans in this audience, whoever you are, voted. And if you didn't feel privately shamed by me, so there. But I'm not. I'm not outing you. Well, let's you know. Let's get into this. Uh, we're all part of this National Council for Election Integrity. Tim and Zach are the ringleaders, and they will discuss uh, the Electoral Count Act because they know more about it than I do. But I just want to set this up in a way that uh, everybody here can can learn a little bit about them because you're all political junkies, or you wouldn't be here. And their stories are great. And we were literally bipartisan buddies in, in the Congress. And it was easy to call them up and say, would you do this? Answer, yes. I knew the answer would be yes. But uh, so uh, let's start with you, Zach, because he's a Republican. <laughs> and uh, you have a story about your two kids who just got elected to office. And you know, tell us just three minutes. Why would you run for Congress? What did you do there? You heard from, from Joey kind of what you did. But what are you most proud of? And, uh, you know, your post-Congress life in, in, in three minutes or less. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, like I, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I mean, this is like as good as it gets for a kid from the South to come to the Kennedy School at Harvard and be associated with y'all, even if it's just for a little while. Uh, my wife, Kim, is here with yeah. me, which we love Boston and we love Harvard. And we've walked right. this campus and just enjoyed the feel. Uh, this is a great place to come. It's a great part of our country. And so thank you for the invitation. You know, I really got involved to begin with, very transparently to tell you, I got a second chance in life. I about blew the first chance in life, and I went sober 39 years ago, and I felt like giving back. And I know that sounds passe, but that's literally what got me into it was I wanted to try to um, help everybody I could because I felt like I had a second chance at life and overcame great odds to get elected because I told the truth about my shortcomings and weaknesses and fought through one close election and lost and ran again and won and got to serve 16 years. And then the craziest thing is Kim and I only have two children. And this summer, they both were on the ballot on the same day in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where we live. My son ran for county mayor. Uh, my daughter ran for district attorney. She ran against the sitting district attorney in the Republican primary. She beat him 72 to 28. Um, and she's a young 33-year-old lawyer with eight years experience as a public defender and assistant district attorney, general counsel to sheriff. And she's the new DA with 26 lawyers uh, that work for her and 54 people. And my son won a three-way contested Republican primary uh, for county mayor by 318 votes. Uh, they appealed it, said that uh, there was fraud. And have you all ever heard that story? And, and the same kind of people appealed it and they lost. And both of my kids, our children, won in the South, telling the truth about elections, about the past president, about the claims of and disinformation that's flooded, 
they won, resoundingly standing on the truth and telling the truth. In fact, my son's podcast, which he did by contract for issue one, called Swamp Stories, which is like 37 episodes, talked all about these issues, including the Electoral Count Act. Uh, the one podcast that he did on the Electoral Count Act was called Regularly Given, because those are the two words in the legislation that Ted Cruz used to raise questions about whether or not the last election should actually be what he called certified, but it's really just counted because the Congress doesn't certify the election. The Electoral College does that. We'll get into all that, but that's what got me involved. Now my kids are involved. They got elected. They're serving big jobs. So we're proud of that, but uh, I'm honored to be here. And public service is, uh, is a noble calling, and it should be. So these are noble public servants. We don't have enough of them anymore. Well, if Zach sounds refreshing, which he does, he's always been like this. Thanks. Outspoken and fun and productive. And I think it's so cool that your children won Thank and you. that as a Republican, you are sticking to a message that I think many in the country responded to in this election. I agree with Biden. I hope you, you all do that democracy won. Yeah, that's right. And people voted for whomever they voted. That's for. right. But hopefully all their votes are going to be counted, whatever they did. And most of them rejected uh, the the kind of circus atmosphere we've been living in for a long time. And Correct. I don't excuse either party from that's that. That's right. But hopefully adult behavior will take over at least in, in, in the ways that it should. Not not all, not every minute, just saying. Uh, but with grandchildren, you're entitled to do something else. But but my point is that it's Zach has always been refreshing Thank you. and 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 always, I, I think, uh, a lodestar for how Congress should have be, should have behaved and should behave. Tim. So we we served on committees together, and Tim, we were all there on 9/11. But Tim, that was a, a you know a, a fulcrum of your career because you went on to serve on the 9/11 Commission. Uh, it's also true that your father-in-law, I know this, is Bennett Johnston, who is a former U.S. senator. So he over did he overlap with you and I? He, he did. Yes, about seven years. Seven, yeah, eight he did. years. He yep. did. Yep. So okay, tell your story. Well, I want to just join in saying what an honor it is for me to be here uh, at this terrific, prestigious, great university. A little intimidating. Uh, I was uh, asked to be a fellow here back in 2011. And the fact that you took 10 years to invite me back, maybe I did something wrong back then. I'm not quite sure, but uh, delighted to be back and, and walk around with your students and see the kind of things that they're interested in doing um, to help the world, to help the United States, to help democracy. Uh, and when we were talking, Hannah, about uh, what the center works on, uh, and we talked about uh, effective and principled leadership. That's exactly what Jane and Zach and me try to work on, enduring results that change things for the better for the country. It's one thing to get up and give a good speech and talk about issues you care about. It's another thing to be a leader who can bring people together from both sides of the aisle, come up with ideas and legislation that actually passes into law and then make sure that that law is implemented for the interests of the citizens and the voters of that country. So I am delighted to be at the center to share in those principled and very, very valued outcomes that you're working on. Jane, congratulations to be a Hauser Fellow, Great. and uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, Zach and I are both jealous. Maybe we'll get there uh, someday. Um, who knows? Hannah's listening. Hannah's yeah. listening for the pitch. Uh, but yeah. I got involved in politics uh, at a very early age. I was in the fifth grade and I was in a Catholic school and the sister said, who wants to run Bobby Kennedy's campaign for president? And my arm shot up. I almost dislocated my. This is Indiana. School. This is in Indiana. Yeah. And that kind of person who brought people together who could, was a conservative and a liberal Democrat at the same time and didn't talk about identity politics, talked about bringing everybody together in the working class. And my parents were great examples to me. My parents were saying, if you don't go into religion, Tim, go into public service. That's the next best thing. And uh, so I ran for office, got elected early uh, in life. We had a great campaign. I went door to door. 
knocked on 25,000 doors, beat the Republican incumbent uh, in a red state and uh, won and never lost until I decided to go do something different. And representing my hometown and my hometown people was the biggest honor that I've had. My, my wife and my kids are my pride and joy, but to represent your hometown in the United States Congress uh, and to fight for what they want and their interests, whether it's Zach, you know, constituent services, helping them with a problem. Uh, I still get people coming up to me in the 7-Eleven saying, Romer, I didn't agree with every vote you did, but I sure liked you helping me get my social security. So, but but it's even more. I I I uh, was elected to the first elected office I I ever ran for, other than junior high school treasurer, which I lost, uh, in in 1991, in the so-called year of the woman, and in my hometown. And serving your hometown is great, but I think all of us just came to Congress knowing that we were serving the country. It wasn't just about party. It certainly wasn't just about getting reelected. And I found, and I, I know you two did too, that making the right vote and explaining it got more respect than just towing the line and being litmus paper, which I'm incapable of being. Right. And I think that that goes for both of you too. So um, before we get to NCEI and this issue, and we'll do it fast, uh, not uh, January 6th, searing mm. moment in the country. Where were you and what are your reactions to what happened on January 6th? I was in my office and my wife knows um, Bob Corker and I both went to the television. Former and, U.S. Senator. Yeah, from and just a great friend of mine. He and I kind of cut our teeth together and uh, plotted both of our lives public service wise um, for years. But we both went to the TV immediately to condemn what had happened, to talk about what a travesty it was and how we all needed to go to work to make sure it never happened again, literally right then and there. Now, Republican from the South, I took a lot of crap immediately from people that were going to defend uh, the former president and what had happened, but we were out there. That, that's what. Good answer. Kim? I travel a lot around the world. I just got back from India, uh, about seven or eight days in India. And I constantly have now people coming up to me saying, what in the world happened to you guys, Tim, on January 6th? What went so wrong in your country when you're this shining beacon of democracy and hope and dreams that your own people would attack your own government and the peaceful transfer of power? I was watching this with my wife at home on TV, and there are three searing events in my life in politics. When RFK, when Bobby Kennedy got assassinated, and my mother woke me up that morning in the fifth, sixth grade, 9-11, when we were up on Capitol Hill and our country was attacked by a foreign power coming to kill 3,000 people on our homeland, and January 6th, that I could not believe. And you know, Jane and Zach and I have been in politics. Jane and I will fight hard for our principles and for democratic policies. And Zach and I will argue at times, even though he's like a brother to me. Uh, I love that guy. Uh, he's a great guy on principle. And, but we will, we will disagree on things. But how do you come to a point like we did on January 6th where our own citizens are attacking and assaulting police officers, where they are invading a peaceful process and transfer of power, where they are disregarding 245 years of history and violently doing that. And that's one of the reasons why we have come together, why we decided as Democrats and Republicans to put our constitution and the country before everything else and work on electoral count reform to work on the modernization of Congress, which I hope we talk about a little bit. Some of the things we've worked on to get money for uh, election uh, infrastructure and trying to make sure that the elections work better. Those things are vitally important to us as citizens and mothers and fathers. You bet. So let's talk about the National Council for Election Integrity, as Tim just served it up and why you two are co-chairing this effort uh, to change the Electoral Count Act uh, to make it 
possible, this would be my shorthand, uh, never to repeat January 6th. So there's four co-chairs of the National Council of Election Integrity. I want you to know that Donna Edwards and Barbara Comstock, Republican and Democrat, are the other two co-chairs. So it's very- Former members. Of former country. members. Uh, and both very outspoken about disinformation and truth and things that really matter. And in the last cycle, uh, in the 2020 election, the National Council of Election Integrity got all the way up to 44, I, I used to say distinguished Americans, but I'm in the group, so it's almost distinguished Americans. But you're married uh, to Kim, it's right, okay. Right, right. So, but it was 22 Republicans and 22 Democrats, people like Dan Coach uh, on our side, uh, just extreme right. credibility. And, you know, all the way to former leader Daschle on the Democratic side and, and everybody in between, credible people who, frankly, when the previous president started talking six months before the election in 2020, that the only way he would lose is if they cheated. We knew there was a problem that a bipartisan team needed to come together around to start monitoring what's going on. We also started doing the research on the disinformation on the internet because it got really, really so outrageous even before the election that th people were being grossly misled about things, which is, as you know, from deep fakes and everything else with artificial intelligence and the modern world we live in, it's frankly real easy to mislead people. And so they get really misled easily. And we knew this was a real problem that could lead to violence on election day, a potential claim that the election was stolen. And so we were working ahead of time with the National Council of Election Integrity. We didn't quit, though. When that election came and went all the way to January the 6th, we basically said after the election, whew, we got through an election without major violence on Election Day. We thought that might happen. But then we started turning our focus on January the 6th because we knew that was another day. And all the chatter out there was building up. This is going to be maybe an overthrow attempt of the government, literally. So we're monitoring it working. We frankly raised a lot of money to try to educate people, too, about the election that this is still the safest, securest, most fair and free elections anywhere in the world. Are they perfect? No. They're carried out at the state level by your neighbors and your friends, but they're still the best anywhere. And if we simply in this democratic republic can't have confidence in our elections, the whole deal comes unraveled. This does not work if we can't trust institutions like free and fair elections. And so we're trying to build trust all the way through the cycle. And now we've got our sights turned on 2024 because the problem is not going away. Last week was a step in the right direction, but the problem is not going away. Tim? Uh, one of the best outcomes of this election so far, I know a lot of people have made a big deal out of Democrats winning the Senate. And as a Democrat, uh, I'm happy about that. Uh, uh, happy about maybe the margin in the House not being a catastrophic red wave. But you know what the best result is? That election deniers at the secretary of state level in particular that run our state elections in Arizona, Nevada, Minnesota, Michigan have all been defeated by the voters. That's what is so reaffirming to me and working in a bipartisan group with Zach and Jane and several other Democrats and Republicans. And we talk about enduring lasting impact that those deniers are now finding out that looking backwards and lying about an election is going to be costly. And they're not going to get into office. They've got to move forward. I also want to say, and I'll probably get in a lot of trouble as a Democrat for this, that there have been unbelievably courageous Republicans that have stepped forward in Georgia, in Arizona, Governor Kemp, Mr. Raffenberger, I think is coming here tomorrow unbelievable courage to step forward and say in Republican primaries, here's the truth, voters. You could knock me out and defeat me for this, but this is the way it happened. And they were resoundly reelected in their primary and they were elected in their general. Same thing happened to some of the Arizona, Maricopa County people and the Secretary of State race out there. Democrats and Republicans are stepping forward together to protect democracy. That's one of the best outcomes we can see. And kids are voting, Joey. Kids are voting, which is really important since it's your country. Uh, my generation's messed it up and you have to fix it. So that's why you have to vote and participate. 
But a couple more comments. Not all the election deniers lost. Let's and be fair. Two, there two were thirds of them. Two thirds. Lost. Two thirds lost. Yeah. One third won. But they're still there, That's and it. and the big lie is still there. And uh, uh, for, the former president may announce for pres uh, for re-election tomorrow, and we're going to hear this again. So it it it's not over, but a huge building block. And, and let's talk about it for 10 minutes. And then we're going to go to your questions. By the way, is there a microphone that's going to go here? Anybody? Uh, because I think in about five minutes, if you want to ask a question, you should line up and identify yourself and ask a question. Um, don't, don't, don't make the, don't, don't do a lecture because we'd love to get to as many people as possible. Uh, but uh, in order to make the 2024 election, uh, at least to prevent the circus of, of January 6th. And let's make another point. Five people died. Numbers of people were wounded, including police. And if the uh, uh, insurrectionists had been more capable, some more people could have been killed. We had most of our government in one building. It's stunning to me that we didn't have the security apparatus for that that we do have for inaugurations because everybody was there except for the president and he wasn't far away watching this on on triple tv screens and and not intervening as we have have, have learned to 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 turn it off but at any rate it was a huge deal i mean imagine the vice president hanged and imagine the speaker of the house uh, uh seriously hurt or killed and the rest of the things that could have happened and we just saw a rerun of this when paul pelosi uh, got viciously attacked a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, to make politicians, um, uh, you know, potential uh, 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 <laughs> criminal victims it, or uh, murder victims is just stunning. I didn't think we'd see it. So let's go to the Electoral Count Act and let's talk about what it does. And I also want to talk about the prognosis for getting it passed. It's already passed the House in one form. I think all of you know this. Uh, uh, before the election, a version of the Electoral Count Act was introduced by Zola Ofgren, a Democrat, and Liz Cheney, a Republican, both of whom were on the uh, January 6th um, committee, and it passed very quickly. It was mostly Democratic votes. It didn't go through a committee process. It just came up on the floor. In the Senate, there is a, uh, a bill that has had much more process applied to it. It is the uh, Susan Collins-Joe Manchin bill. It's supported by uh, a third of the Senate so far, including, get this, I think this is unprecedented, unprecedented Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer. <laughs> Let's wrap your head around that. The, head, the chairman and, and ranking member of the Senate Rules Committee and a list of worthies uh, on, in both parties. And it has enough votes to get to 60 so that there won't be a filibuster that would apply if it's called up. So. Zach, what, what's in it and, and why is this a good thing? Well, either of us could talk for an hour without stopping about we'll the details. For... I'm, I'm going to just set the stage on what this really is. Uh, one, one of the things after the former president declared that uh, maybe they could overturn the results after the 2020 election was based on this archaic law called the Electoral Count Act when Senator Cruz said that some, some language in the bill, like the words regularly given, was put in this in 1887, you know, after the Civil War, we had these same kind of conflicts about electing presidents. And there was a, a, a bill written because some of the slate of electors from the states uh, were questionable. Some states submitted two slates of electors. Some may have been bribed. And so they came up with a bill called the Electoral Count Act that would actually sort of codify the response to what happened in 1887. And the words regularly given meant that uh, the, the slate of electors from the Electoral College from that state, uh, they, weren't, they weren't under duress. They didn't have a gun at their head when they submitted them. They were regularly given, meaning nobody got bribed. There was no laws broken. They were regularly given. Well, he used that to say to President Trump and Giuliani and other people, uh, there's questions, there's recounts, there's questions about Ohio and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. So it may not be regularly given. Therefore. Let's let's go to January the 6th and the vice president can overturn this election and the Congress can overturn it. And all this misinformation flies out the window to 60 million people. And he literally convinces 40 million of them that the election was stolen and that something's got to be done about it. 
So you create this fire and it just starts blazing across the country. And now everybody, you couldn't have done that without this. You could not have done that 20 years ago. It's impossible to mobilize millions of people to actually have the tip of the iceberg be people that descend on Washington with this strategy of bear spray and whatever weapons they could sneak into the, to literally almost like the Keystone cops, but have a motive of we're going to overturn the election result. That's what got us here. That's why everything. Now, this this bill, the updated Electoral Count Act, is not going to fix this, but at least is a marker that we can refer to in the future if there's a close election as to what we're going to do. And let me go back and say, in 2020, we had a ridiculously close election. Y'all remember the hanging chads? We, 2000. Excuse me, 2000. 2000. We, we responded to that. And we fixed that problem. In fact, I would say whether you like Florida or not, they know how to run elections very efficiently. Tons of people vote early. Tons of people vote absentee. Uh, Senior citizens have all the access. And every vote is counted by 11 o'clock on election night. And they absolutely give you the results. So they responded to 2000. And now we have to respond to what happened January the 6th. We have to respond to what happened in 20. We have to respond to what happened last week. We need to respond and prepare for 2024 to make sure that we do dot our I's and cross our T's, whether we're in office or have been there and have something to share. That's what we're doing. And okay, so Tim, what do the amendments do? Uh, oh, you give me the tough part. Yeah, now. well, yeah, details. All right, you know, yeah, I do. I've always done this to you. I know. Well, so I what do they do? Very disappointed. What, Kelly, do you know? You know, and 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 strategize about the House has passed one version, the Senate has a different version. What needs to get done to make this law, uh, hopefully in the lame duck session? So, going back to January sixth for a second, this was an electoral coup based on lies, misinformation. And just all kinds of problems across social media. Zach just pulled out, you know, his copy, his his phone number, his phone. There's a copy of the Constitution. Yeah. That's what brings Zach and me together every day. That that Constitution and country come before the Republican Party or the Democratic Party right here, and trying to make sure that the laws are written clearly enough. And obviously, this 1887 Electoral Count Act, written back on the Hayes-Tilden contested presidential race, was not tight enough, was opaque, and was very, very poorly written. So what we've tried to do is update it, update it on making sure that the vice presidential role is simply ministerial or ceremonial. That vice president, he or she, we have a woman vice president today that might be there in 2024, that nobody can take the votes away from the people. No politician in Washington can steal the votes of the people. They are there simply to count the votes. Two, it used to be that any one, remember this, Jane, any one member of Congress could go on the House floor or the Senate floor and object to this whole procedure. One person. This new act that we have helped shepherd through has a 20% threshold so that no one Democrat or Republican can hold things up. It's going to take significantly higher threshold. And a third big change of the Electoral Count Act is judicial review. Trying to make sure if there is a contested one slate, two slates, couple slates competing against each other, there's expedited judicial review that will bring this to resolution and not delay the counting of the people's votes and the people's decision on something like that. This is important legislation. This is enduring legislation, to use your terminology here. This is essential to try to make sure that another January 6th is not repeated and we have a peaceful transfer of power. And nobody like a Donald Trump or anybody else can exploit those loopholes and say, giving misinformation, here's what you can do, Mike Pence. 
that you can do this. No, it's very clear now, Jane, you can't. Finally, the part of your, your question about strategy, right. not only has our work, and Zach has done great work on this, uh, particularly in the United States Senate, but um, we have not only Mr. Schumer and Mr. McConnell together as the two leaders, uh, both supporting this Electoral Account Reform Act, on the Rules Committee vote, evenly divided because the Senate's evenly divided. We had 14 Republicans and Democrats vote for it and one Republican vote against it, 14 to one. Now, you guys all read about how dysfunctional Washington can be at times. That is a resounding embrace of this legislation on 14 to one. However, uh, it doesn't matter unless this thing in the same form ends up passing the Senate and the House. And the version that the House has passed is somewhat different from the yeah. version pending different in the Senate. Threshold, uh, and, and a fear is that Mitch McConnell, who apparently has said this, will bail on this thing if the legislation is significantly changed. So what's your formula, Tim? You're the Democrat. Just thought I should point that out. For getting the House, this would seem to me to be the best thing to do, to accede to the Senate version of the bill. Well, you know, I do have to give um, Congresswoman Cheney, who was, I think, here speaking the other day, credit yep. uh, and Zoe Lofgren credit. That's a strong bill that they've written, uh, a very good, solid piece of legislation. Lame duck sessions are very tricky and short, and anything can happen. And so the best politics for the country on this, the best for the voters on this, is to probably have the Senate version not go to conference for the House to accede to the Senate version and vote up and down on it. For that to happen, Jane, as you know, people have to go to the speaker and explain why this is in the interests of the Democratic Party and the people of the country. Zoe Lofgren should be uh, thanked for her hard work, but also convinced that this is the best way to go without a time. We may not have a lot of time, Zach, to do a conference between the two, which is usually the best way to legislate. Line up for questions, folks. We're getting to questions. Add one thing while they're lining up. But because, line up, line yeah. up. I Remember. Think, I think this is like for the, for the Kennedy School here. This, you could write a book about the examples where the when the framer said the passions of the house and the, and the, the Senate being the saucer underneath the hot coffee, you know, they drew that analogy that the house is where the passions of the people would be in the hot cup of coffee, but the Senate would be the saucer, which that coffee would cool before you could sip it and drink it. This is a perfect example there because I, I did work the Senate on this electoral count act. And many of these people weren't on the ballot last week because the Senate has a six year term and they're staggered. And a lot of these people, I'll give you an example, Roger Wicker of Mississippi, who we served with in the House. He looked at this like not through the political prism of are the Trump people going to come after me because I'm doing something to clean this up or point back to what went wrong and what needs to be fixed. He looked at it because he's a senator with a six year term from what's best for the country. You say, well, how are the we, I wasn't going to use the former president's name, but I'll say the Trump loyalists in the House. You know, there's so many that are just. What, they're in a two-year term, the passions of the people, two-year term, got to get reelected, got to get reelected, got to get reelected. The framers were brilliant in separating this, and I know they weren't elected at first, but the whole notion that there would be a body that would actually offset these passions that sometimes can just get fever pitched and you go too far, the Senate is where this is going to be done. And I believe, you know, Leader McConnell indicated early on, that fixing this was probably going to be done in the lame duck because to do it in a regular, under the regular order, too much passion, too many people firing shots, you know, and, and we're still in the middle of this rancid political tribalism. But you see the system working. So I leave Chattanooga Day and a businessman says, what do you think about last week's election? I said, as a Republican, I would love for the, the Senate to stay you know, going Republican. But I said, what I'm really encouraged about is that the system is working again. It's working again. Democracy did win because the system is working again. And there is 
what uh, uh, we had two analogies I thought were good. David Brooks said the fever is breaking in his piece. And then Nick Penniman said the sky is breaking through the clouds. And that's what we need because the system is working. Even the Senate and the House here is working. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Uh, identify yourself and ask your question. Hi, I'm Joanne. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it is. I think so. So, um, Joanne, I'm in the mid-career program here. I hope you can. I'm not sure. You're it from is Tennessee. That. Wait a minute. Wait, where are you from in Tennessee? Where in Tennessee? I, I grew up in Knoxville, and I live in Nashville now. Wow, good for you. Okay. Know it well. Joey's going to fix the mic. There. Yeah, it it's is on. on. Okay. Need to get closer. Um. So yes, as you pointed out, Liz Cheney was just here, and there are some big enough differences between the two bills that have been proposed mm -hmm. that um she has a definite opinion on which one's better. Yeah. Um, can you maybe go into just the one or two things that are different between the two versions um, to kind of explain why yeah. there might be sticking points? Well, the main thing is a 30 percent threshold uh, in the House and the Senate. 30 percent of the members would have to object for some valid reason to the electoral results in order to actually have a vote. And in the Senate, it's only 20 percent. So that's a that's a big number. I mean, it, it's a difference of 10 percent, which in the Senate is 10 people and in the House is. 43 people. So those are big differences. That's the main difference. Yeah. And but to be fair, uh, right now it's one person and yeah, it, right. it, 20 it, or 30 yeah, percent. Either and, one. Uh, would and be. This isn't the first time this has happened. Barbara Boxer, a former mm -hmm. Democratic senator, objected to the election in, in 04. 2000. 04. 04? 2004. Yeah. OK. Uh, the, when Kerry was running? Yeah. I thought it was OK. Uh, and so, and there have been other, I think three or four other instances. So the goal would be to make this very hard to do. Yeah. I, I guess your Tennessee football team is having a pretty good year, huh? Not bad. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So no, any not bad. But other differences. I, I would just say that there's also a big political difference. There's the pride of the house, as you pointed out and alluded to in your question, both, uh, Cheney and Lofgren are from the January 6th committee. They did exhaustive interviews on this um, whole Electoral Count Act process. And so both in terms of the threshold number uh, being slightly different, I think there's a slight difference in the judicial review right. and the time period on judicial review and state review on that. But look, what I say to my you know, Democrats all the time is, you know, John Lewis used to say to me all the time, make good trouble. This is good trouble legislation to pass, whether, whether we do it with a 20 percent or a 30 percent threshold. So quickly, too, he talks about the politics of it. Let's be candid here. In the Senate, we have 11 co-sponsors of this legislation, Republicans, right? 11. Yeah. 11 we expect 20. 20 or more senator, Republican senators that are going to vote for it. In the House, the Republican leadership did not support this. So when you're talking about which side you would actually yield to, I would argue as a Republican that they need to yield to the Senate version of this bill, which is where the most Republican senators are willing to step in and support it. That's just practical it's politics. Including McConnell. 101. That, so right. it needs, probably what needs to happen is the Senate prevails here. Yeah. Uh, next question, and then I'm going to take one from our Zoom audience. Hi, my name is Drisana Hughes. I'm a master in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Thank you three so much for speaking. Wow. Um, I'm from New York where there's been lots of efforts by the state legislature to kind of make voting harder. Um, and I, I was wondering, you all come from three different states. Um, the, the Electoral Count Act that you're working on at the federal level is super, super important. How do we make sure people like local elected county leadership, like it's trickling all the way down and that after these presidential elections come and go, like we don't forget the urgency of this moment um, and, and make sure that we all as a, as a country are keeping good. keeping foot on the gas. Well, Zach, your Great kids. Question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Great your question. kids just won elections that were in a cakewalk. Well, and I may say something. Office. This this may not be popular, but it's true. OK, so like when our tour organizations issue one and national council of election integrity began to analyze what was going on at the state level with some of the state initiatives to change their voting laws they a lot of them started yelling about what happened in georgia and you know that they called it jim crow 2.0 and they talked about voter suppression well you know what happened last week just the opposite 100 percent, just the opposite record turnout in every demographic unbelievable access so Let's all be careful here 
that we don't catch the latest slogan and not realize what is good policy and try to improve everyone's right, even though the states carry out these elections. Here's what I believe really needs to happen. We need to incentivize the states to all have laws like Florida does to allow early voting, to allow absentee voting, to allow total access to vote, but make sure that you can count those votes, log them in as they come in, so that on the election day, we have a result. Any one week, two weeks, your home state of New York two years ago was counting congressional votes three weeks later. Does that sow confidence in the American electorate from either party? Or does it sow some concern like what's up here? So let's give everybody a break and have some uniform best practices across the country so that we can have all of this decided ahead of midnight on election day. Okay. I, I, I think it's a great question. Um, let me answer it similarly to what I said to George Washington University when I was there two weeks ago. One of the questions was, how do I have confidence in my vote? What do we young people in college, graduate school do about the system and the polarization today? I think one, run for office. Like the wants. Kim, are you ready for having two more kids? Uh, you probably had to get a couple more uh, in the system uh, to run for office. Little run for office. Look at school boards are now determining what kind of books we read and what's banned and what's not. Look at Big mayoral name. races. Look at state legislatures that are deciding the abortion issue and access. So these are huge opportunities for you to run at the local and the state level where it is sometimes more important than the federal level. Two, I think a great thing is to do more of what you're doing today. My kids have gone to colleges where the Democratic Club and the Republican Club bring in competing you know, uh, speakers and they all yell at each other and they're never on the same stage. So students never see a Democrat and Republican who have respect for one another like we do. Bring people in together, have them sit up here, know they're, we're all from the same country. We all have kids and family. We all want a better country. That's not something Harvard can do is do more of bringing people together. And lastly, national service. So many of our folks from Texas to Tennessee and South Bend, Indiana to Spokane, Washington, they don't know each other anymore. And they're easily divided on, on the internet. Let's have one year of mandatory service for our people to come together. You don't have to serve in the military. You can work on a project, a water security project in Arizona. But let's bring our citizens together more so they know each other more. All right, so we're gonna have one question from Zoom land and you'll be the final question. And we'll do this very fast. The question from Zoom land looking at these uh, that I think is the most relevant is, and I'll just read part of it. It's evident that America is a major proponent of democracy across the world. We also see the efforts America makes in affecting world democracies positively. What advice can, can the panelists give to other democracies outside the United States? in putting country and constitution or country and rule of law uh, above party politics? Very short answer. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi used to say, in all things, preach the gospel, and when absolutely necessary, use words. Our example <laughs> is the best thing we can offer the rest of the world, mm -hmm. and it ain't very pretty right now. What happened on January the 6th and what's happened in the last two election cycles is not the example we want to set. The best thing we can do for other emerging democracies and against authoritarianism in the world is to do this well. This experiment has to be preserved. And if we'll do it well, they'll do it well. That's a good answer. Joe Nye, uh, Dr. Nye is sitting in the audience and uh, he's worked on all kinds of different international security issues. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I think we need to do is make sure that this sweeping change around the world of authoritarianism and almost anti-democratic efforts, whether we're talking about Hungary, happened in Brazil, the Philippines. She is a nationalist in China promoting 
uh, the self-interest and national interest of China, it is sweeping everywhere, including the United States. So how do we work at issue one in the National Council on Election Integrity to bring groups of people together, have forums where you go back out and you talk about this? That's what enduring effective leadership is about, is taking it out of the room and spreading the gospel, so to speak, of democracy. And it's also best practices, Jane. It's also when we get together with our bilateral relationships around the world, I just came back from India, is not preaching to them about you guys have to be doing this because we have our own problems here at home. What can we learn from each other? How do we make democracy stronger around the world? I was just going to add that Joe is the one, uh, Dr. Nye, who coined the term soft power, also the term mm. are terms hard power and smart power. But this is a huge example of soft power, showing by example yeah. Critically what America's important. values are. Last question. Here she is. All right. Thank you for taking the question. Um, Hannah it's Martin, our- I am a master's in public policy student here at HKS. Um, I identify as a Democrat. I don't usually wish success upon Republicans. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry uh, He's really but, nice. Yeah. Uh, but I have been alarmed at the direction of the Republican Party. Just the momentum seems like the majority is in this sort of election denying camp. And I'm curious to the to the point of the fever breaking and having a few brave Republicans, you know, almost so few that you can name them. What else do we think needs to happen to get the Republican Party back to a state of, you know, sanity. Courage. Um, and and you're, you know, the word courage means to give courage, to encourage means to give courage. And so we need to encourage people to step out. There, there, there's this quiet majority in our party that has been intimidated and bullied. Don't know what I mean for a while. And so that has to change. And uh, I do think it is beginning to change in a meaningful way. And our family's been fighting this fight for a few years because we felt like this was not. I'm a conservative. I happen to be a Republican, but really I'm a conservative, not a populist. There's a massive difference. And so there's there's a debate here is whether we're going to go in the direction of Ronald Reagan, who broke bread with Tip O'Neill and showed us how conservatives should govern and that politics is a game of addition, not subtraction. And I want us to go back there. And I am not alone. I'm not alone. But a lot of people that think like me didn't have the guts to say it. And they're becoming empowered. And frankly, the governor of Florida is giving them some empowerment. And so who knows where this goes, but I do believe the system is working again. And I do think the pendulum is swinging back And I do think that the rest of the world will say, I'll be darn, the U.S. actually did it again. We recovered from a bad place. We've done that several times in our history. And and January 6th was a really bad moment, but I believe we're going to recover. And whether you're Republican or Democrat, it's, it's in the best interest of all of us to have two healthy, honest parties. And I will add into that, that this is not just a problem for the Republican Party. Mm -mm. We need to tone the rhetoric down in both our parties. Democrats cannot go around saying all Republicans are racist. Republicans can't go around saying all Democrats are socialists. Or Republicans, I saw a couple on the air the other day saying, Democrats all want to destroy America. Destroy it. Destroy the country. We'll never have a country if you elect Democrats. Let's, we we never used that language when we ran 15 and 20 years ago. Never. It never would enter our vocabulary. Yeah, I might disagree with a Republican about a policy issue and go, you know, I I beat six Republicans every time. I'm not going to back down on the fight and the passion. But saying that a fellow American, wants to destroy my country or is a racist, let's let's have more sense in our country on both sides and have some dialogue and at least come together on democracy and how important it is and what Tocqueville uh, said about this being such a shining example to the rest of the world that everybody wants to emulate. And I can tell you, having lived in India, 
People still want to come here. This is the place people want to come for their dreams. So let me uh, close with a personal story. Thank you for your question. Uh, and thank these two wonderful friends of mine. Uh, See so you. there. Uh, my personal story is that I was elected to Congress in 1992 in a lean Republican district. I don't know what yours was like. It must lean have been Republican, because yeah. you beat a Republican. In 94, that's when Newt Gingrich came to power. Does anybody remember Newt Gingrich? And it was a huge election, and the Democrats lost control of the House for the first time in 40 years. Uh, on election night, when the polls closed, California is not right. fast at counting voting. Right. Oops. Uh, when the polls, when they stopped counting at 5 a.m., it was done very differently. I was down 250 votes, and there were 10,000 uncounted absentee ballots. Uh, my opponent immediately declared victory, flew to Washington to campaign for class president. Uh, my campaign advisors advised, well, hey, 10,000 uncounted votes, get a good lawyer, which was a good idea. And my opponent got a good lawyer, or she got a lawyer. And at the end of two weeks, two weeks, uh, I was certified the winner by 811 votes out of 200,000 plus. And then my opponent filed a challenge under the National Contest of Elections Act, which still exists. And that lasted for nine more months. Mm -hmm. I was already certified, so I was in Washington. And at, at that point, she dropped it. But I'm just saying every vote does count and mm -hmm. should count. That was a fair election. Yep. And just think, if I had lost, you wouldn't have me as your friend. So after all, um, this is about, seriously, uh, making our elections mean something again. And I agree with Zach that, that Tuesday, was that this week or that was last, last week? week. Yeah. That and I agree with the president too. Uh, that last Tuesday, democracy won, and let's just build on it and make it even better. And yeah. and let's pass these electoral count act uh, reforms. And thank you to NCEI and these two amazing guys uh, for for coming here and being so special. Thank you. Thank you for having us, man. Great idea to have us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zach. Thank okay, folks. Well, well, five minutes over. Sorry. Sorry. Close. Uh, yeah.